uh, just want to thank you all for being here tonight and uh, very much to thank uh, Dr. Fabian Sanders, um, who will be speaking with us um, as well on this very magnificent gompa um, that I think many of us in the audience this evening are familiar with, but maybe not to the extent that uh, Fabian uh, has been for, for many decades. Um, so without uh, any real ado, what I'll, I'll talk about is I, re I do realize that many of us do know Fabian uh, very well, uh, but then you will also know how modest he is. Um, so to continue on with a, a bit more of a background um, about, about Fabian, um, as well as this evening, is, you know, he has studied Asian languages, traditions and cultures extensively, which I think many of us know. Um, and in recent years, he has concentrated the teaching classical Tibetan language. Um, and after studying for more than 25 years, languages and cultures of Tibet, China and India in both academic and traditional settings, Dr. Fabian Sanders was a professor at Tibetan language and culture at the University of Kas uh, sorry, Fabian, I had it perfectly. Um, Kafoska, um, to in uh, Venice. He has also been teaching language and translation courses for the International Shenzhen Institute for many years, um, as we are aware. Um, he is uh, one of our directors. Um, he has in recent years made numerous field trips to Tibet, China and India in pursuit of his research into Tibetan oracles and related themes. He has been a student of Chogyal Namkai Nobu for more than 20 years and is the author of the volume La Lingua Tibetana Classica, um, the first classical Tibetan grammar book in Italian. And this, this evening, um, in, in this context as well, you know, uh, he has translated the Tibetan text in which Chogyal Namkai Norbu described how the temple should be decorated by the artist and the meaning of it. He has also collected, translated and edited the biographies of the Tibetan masters depicted in the Gompa. All, all of this was done on the basis of previous work as well of Jacobella. And I would like to now ask you all to join me in welcoming uh, Fabian. Um, and Fabian, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this lecture uh, this evening. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much for this excessive introduction. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, yes, my my connection with the with the Gumpa book, uh, this uh, the title of which I hope you can see on the uh, the front, um, uh, the cover of which you can see on your screen. I hope, uh, which I'm sharing, uh, is that I I inherited, so to say, the. Um, rather enormous task of um, uh, completing this book because it, it has um, many aspects, many different aspects aside from the uh, uh, Tibetan, the translation of uh, the Tibetan um, uh, text by Chögyal Namke Norbu on the, um, let's say the, um, the guidebook for the artists to uh, decorate the uh, the gumpa, um, and um, also to uh, collect the biographies of all the masters that are depicted inside the gumpa itself, uh, which are um, around uh, 147, if I remember well. So you can imagine uh, that it was quite a big uh, uh, task to complete this, and in fact. Um, Jacobella Gaetani worked on it, uh, of course, not full time, but something like 20 years before she started to realize that 
maybe some help would be needed. So I, I came in and we completed it then uh, together. Um, of course, um, the, the book that you can see, may, maybe many of you have this book, I should maybe um, have this book is um, only concentrating and discussing the decorations. Uh, let's say the paintings, the, um, no, maybe I would like rather to see some of you. <laughs> At least I'm not talking to my, my bottles here on the table. And uh, uh, yes, of course. Um, maybe I should start apologizing for sometimes not being completely focused. It's not easy. Maybe some of you have this experience as well to sit in a room alone and talk about some topic. When it's grammar and so forth, it is okay, but these kind of topics are less um, inviting to do these kind of things. In any case, um, I think the best way is that I talk for like some time and then uh, maybe you can ask questions um, in the last part before uh, we stop. So if, if you, while I'm going, if you have questions, please, uh, maybe you can even write them down in the chat or you can write them down on some paper so you remember, or you can just remember them. And um, I was saying that um, the, um, uh, of course, the subject of the decorations of the gompa is kind of um, a secondary step, let's say, in the construction of the gromba. It is something that happens once the architectural structure of the gromba itself is already standing. And this is something about which we do not have many information how that came into existence, how the uh, conception and the idea of this, um, of this gromba came uh, to form itself in the intellect or the mind of uh, um, there are no informations about that. I don't think he has written anything about that. I don't think even he has talked very much about that. But as a matter of fact, the Gompa was there as a, at a certain point. And uh, as usual, uh, in the Tibetan world, where the idea of art is really uh, that of um, an instrument to um, assist uh, beings in uh, going ahead on the path of liberation. Really, um, traditional art, in any case, and particularly in Tibetan traditional art, uh, that's the main focus, the main uh, concern, the main reason or cause for the production of any artistic uh, item. We might even go as far as to say of any item to cure. Uh, a Tibetan master uh, recognizes or starts from the idea that there's something wrong in the way in which we exist normally. Uh, there is something lacking. There is a shortcoming. There is an underlying uh, element of, uh, or reality of suffering that, um, underlines all of uh, samsaric existence. So um, once they come in, co in contact with the teaching, with that element that um, assists, helps, and um, actually produces the um, realizations that uh, allow people to go beyond this condition of suffering, maybe uh, transcending it altogether, or just by realizing that uh, samsara and nirvana, you know, this duality, uh, are nothing else than two aspects of the same thing. And that true freedom, true realization, true um, uh, emancipation or enlightenment um, can be experienced within illusory perception within uh, the world that we are convinced that we are living in. And so whatever they do, whatever they, they uh, engage in, 
has uh, this um, purpose alone, the purpose to help being to tame their own minds, to gain mastery upon their own minds, and do this by using any kind of tool or instrument or uh, expressive means or language or structure that they might have available. In fact, uh, art is one of the five, uh, the, the five main sciences that is understood to be one of the best tools to, uh, to make people in this case understand, humans understand uh, the, the, the path, the realities to which the path uh, takes. In fact, um, art in, understood in this case in the limited um, way of um, being uh, figurative art, meaning let's say art um, figurative like painting, sculpture and so forth, uh, including architecture, um, are very often uh, a more direct language, a more uh, direct, they, they transmit a more uh, core or crucial experience to the viewer. Um, different from words, from um, texts, from speech, um, which require a mind to reason, to use words, to work with this and that. Uh, visual art has the possibility when it is well realized and well uh, used, employed, applied uh, to give to the a viewer a more direct experience of the, the signified reality, much more than words, in fact. Um, art is understood as a symbol, as a kind of medium or inter intermediate um, element between the viewer and the reality beyond that is signified. The viewer is expected to understand to have an intuition of the reality beyond by means of art. And um, maybe I should close down and go and come to the Gompa itself. Um, very often art, let me say this last uh, idea, is the, uh, a, an excellent way, a perfect way to express what is not expressible to give an idea of something that is beyond words, that is beyond uh, the, the very workings of the discursive mind that uses words as its tools um, uh, through images. So, um, Some of the things that are uh, implied in um, traditional art and architecture are kind of a common ground uh, of um, art in uh, many parts of the world. I might say um, some of the principles that are, for example, contained in the Merigar Gompa, uh, some of the expressive tools are actually um, universal, I would say. Mm? Uh, we will come back to that later. Our, our elements and uh, strategies of communication that can be understand, understood um, by anyone without any prior instruction uh, in, the specific, in the specificities of the uh, Tibetan tradition, Tibetan culture, Tibetan, uh, you know, art. One can behold the Gompa 
uh, and and um, take some information and understand things uh, without having any prior uh, culture. Um, other things in the Gompa are very strongly culturally related, um, meaning that um, they speak a very specific language, um, artistic language that can be read only if the viewer has a certain familiarity or competence with that artistic language. Um, he, for example, he or she obviously, please uh, take that for granted or whatever. Um, for example, uh, the use of colors, which color means what? Hmm? The use of certain patterns, the use of geometrical forms, and so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, you know, it comes down also to the, uh, let's say, the iconography of uh, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, deities, masters, and so forth. These are very much uh, culturally, strongly culturally related to Tibetan, to the Tibetan world. Uh, a lot of things can be understood just by looking at a painted image, you know, uh, but provided you have the vocabulary and you understand the grammar that is used in expressing these, um, these um, sorry, I didn't want to do that, um, in expressing these principles. So um, when building this gompa, which is, I think, to my knowledge, uh, a unique example um, of this kind of uh, architecture, let's, let's talk first of the uh, structure of the gompa. Uh, I think although they, there are um, similar uh, buildings in uh, Tibet particularly, that have this, um, that maybe um, are shaped more or less um, using the, uh, the tent, the nomad tent as an example. No? Um, this element might be present in the Gompa as well. But as far as I know, in Western countries, this kind of, of um, Tibetan Gompa is um, unknown before and after this, or aside this, uh, this specific gompa here. Um, in general, um, sacred architecture in, in Tibet has um, a few um, characteristics that are given uh, by the things that are um, expressed, but also by the uh, environmental con conditions, no? um, by the availability of building materials, and so on and so forth. Um, so in Tibet, the, the, the gompa buildings, the you know the uh, the um, let's say sacred architecture um, is extremely limited in terms of what forms it can. Uh, produce because, for example, wood is a, um, a building material that is not really readily available in most parts of the Tibetan plateau. So, um, um, when uh, thinking to build a gompa in Italy, in the west, in uh, uh, southern Tuscany, in Italy, uh, Rinpoche was um, rather free to just do what he what he thought, no? Because he had not these um, constrictions uh, given from, you know, tradition, which is obviously um, also playing a role here in the sense that um, uh, Tibetans, when they they have a, a, a gompa built, they expect certain forms. They expect that it has uh, more or less square. Um, base 
and it has uh, wooden floors and, uh, and so on and so forth. But in, in Italy, people would not expect anything from a Tibetan Gopa. So Rinpoche was really free to do whatever he thought was the best form, not only in expressive terms as well, uh, of course, which were naturally his first, um, his first, first you know, uh, objective, but also in terms of uh, usability, in terms of the, the uh, pleasure that the place would give to the people who would sit in it to receive teachings. No? And uh, I'm sure that anyone of you who have had this, this opportunity to listen to some teachings while sitting in the gompa, uh, I'm sure everyone has had this, uh, sooner or later, this idea of uh, sitting in a really um, spiritually elevated place, let's say. No, so uh, let's come down to the probably. Um, I apologize for being a bit uh, maybe uh, confused in what I I said up to this point, but I hope I can um, make up for that as we go on, and um, we come to the actual uh, gomba in how it is um, uh, now. Uh, first of all, it is um, useful to, this is a Google, um, Google Maps um, image, satellite, so anyone of you can go and uh, locate the Gompa. Um, the first thing that a Tibetan uh, master who wants to build a, a Gompa um, Keep, takes into consideration is the place where the gompa is to be built. It has to be a place that has certain uh, geomantic fe features, geomancy, um, which is a traditional science that is uh, that um, devotes itself to the analysis of the land, basically geo, not geomancy, in in. Uh, Tibetan, it's called the sache, which means analysis of the earth. Um, that is the first thing taken into consideration. The uh, gompa has to um, is ideally built in things that have certain conditions, but if those conditions are not present, we can kind of come down uh, to you know. Uh, from you know the best place down to the second best, the third best, and so forth, whatever is available. No, but in the case of the Merigar Gompa, a place was found. I'm not sure if it was um, intended to be so or it just turned out to be like that. Uh, a place was found that has a few features that are very appreciated in uh, Tibetan Germancy, in particular. And I think you can see that from here, uh, from this image, maybe, uh, I thought I had two of those in any case. Oh yeah, the other one is here. This is a more, oh yeah. No, I wanted, sorry, to go back to that. Um, you can see here that um, if you imagine that from the right side to the um, left side, the, is, it is a hillside, so it is going down in uh, elevation. No? So here, this being the higher place and this being the lower place. So Gompa is placed on a kind of a hill that comes out from the ground, stands up from this, uh, from this lateral decreasing uh, hillside. No? And uh, it is a little bit round in shape, as you can see here. No, it is a kind of, um, let's say, a, um, a half sphere. Let's say approximately. This is a very interesting feature. You will find many of uh, temples built on such uh, places in Tibet because they kind of resemble a lotus flower, in the sense the valley around is considered to be the petals and this protuberance or hill 
that comes out from the side of the mountain. So not from the rock, from the bottom of the, uh, which is quite rare. You don't, you never have, you know, hills in the, uh, that's rare, but existing. In any case, um, mostly these are on the side of one of the hills of the valley that, that form the valley. So this comes out and uh, allows the, the gompa to be placed in this that symbolically represent the center of the lotus. No? And the lotus is, of course, a very uh, important symbolic element. Um, maybe we'll come back to that later, but for the time being, we can um, just note that the lotus is a symbol for potentiality, is a symbol uh, of the ability particularly of, um, let's say, um, the, the uh, gross and the earthy part of elements, let's say, to produce phenomena, no? The lotus is, is, as a kind, is understood as a kind of matrix or as the base element from which, which provides the, um, the, uh, phenomenal or gross or elemental items that are uh, needed to produce actual, to complete actual phenomena. No? So lotuses, in fact, are potentialities. They symbolize the potentiality. And they can be a gross potentiality. So they sit on the ground uh, looking upwards, or they can be sometimes um, let's say uh, more possibilities than potentialities. And from in this sense, they look down from the top to the ground. We'll come back to that later. So uh, you can see this situation uh, of the, um, of the uh, Merigar Gompa um, a little bit in this picture. Now you see that this side of the hill is going down and this is a mountain that comes out from this hillside, no? And uh, uh, unfortunately, as I'm not in Merigal now, I, I was not able to provide more pictures uh, in, in your, than in my intent to show certain things. In any case, I think this is uh, already quite nice to, uh, to appreciate that aspect, no? So, the Gompa sits ideally in the middle of a symbolically identified uh, geomantic lotus. Um, you can see that maybe also uh, from this one, a little less maybe. So um, another thing that is extremely important that we can see um, just uh, looking at the gompa is that it has a octagonal shape. So it is built in a way in which uh, there are eight um, equally uh, long uh, sides to the, uh, to the building. And it is uh, ori oriented in an east-west direction where these um, portal, which is, sorry, the, um, the main entrance is um, oriented towards the east, which is also a very important feature uh, often found in uh, the, uh, I would say, Indo-Tibetan world. So um, the, the first rays of the sun enters enter the door, the main door, and um, they uh, directly um, and illuminate or you know um, um, contact with the teacher who is sitting on the west uh, side, looking eastwards. Okay, so. Um, this uh, interestingly um, picture has been taken by the satellite when the Gompa was in renovation. 
And um, so the, um, yeah, the, uh, uh, horizontal section of the uh, diagonal, and this is done in a um, um, has obviously a number of important uh, symbologies linked to it. Um, in a very broad way, we might say that um, there are three geometrical shapes that. Uh, are very frequent in sacred buildings all over the world. And these are the square, the octagon, and the uh, circle, okay? These three refer to uh, three parts of the world within which uh, humans live. Namely, the square part is the um, the uh, earth, symbolizing the earth, so the base upon which um, humans walk. The octagon symbolizes the horizontal world. It symbolizes the uh, world in which uh, humans, we are talking about humans in this case because that's our situation and that is uh, what we have to work with. No? And basically all these things are, um, are targeted for humans. No? Um, other aspects uh, target other beings. We will come back to that uh, later on. I'm noticing that um, I have a lot to say. Well, obviously the Gompa is a thing about which one could talk really for uh, weeks, in fact. Uh, but um, I was saying the square is the earth, the octagon is the intermediate world, the flat world, the world of action of humans, the world where they uh, produce, they, where they have produced their past and where they are going to produce their present and future. And um, uh, also to that will come be later, we'll come back later. And then um, the, uh, circle is symbolizing the sky or the world above. No, this is uh, quite mm, common in the world. Uh, for example, here we have a um, a bell tower in northern Italy, where you can clearly see the base is a square. Then there is a part that is uh, octagonal, and then the top has various levels of circles, okay, all developing along a central axis, which also is a very recurrent um, uh, element. Another interesting information would be, uh, for example, there are um, in the Western world um, some buildings that are octagonal and uh, which have a they are mostly octag octagonal. Most of these these kind of buildings is octagonal, and uh, they are the baptistries. Um, this one being the one of Saint John. They are very ancient. You can see from the 11th century. Um, sorry, this was okay. Um, because a baptistry, uh, when a child received a, a baptism he is kind of, uh, he becomes a proper human, let's say in a, a certain sense in uh, the Western tradition. And uh, he is ready to enter uh, society. And society lives in the, uh, you know, uh, horizontal world, no? Society is moving in the horizontal ways. It's not going down and not going up. Um, the up the path towards the sky and the path towards below are not social paths, no, they are individual paths. So the building is octagonal, no, that's also an interesting information. O of course, on top it's still round, and probably somewhere down below there is a square base 
that doesn't need to be apparent. In fact, in the Gompa as well, it's not very apparent that there is a square base. Obviously, it was not easy to build that or to make that on a, um, on a mostly round uh, hill. Um, it would have been, you know, awkward. Probably here the square is represented by the earth itself. So, um, around the Gompa, uh, the first thing that is described uh, in the um, manuscript of the Gompa is the fence that is uh, encircling the, um, the uh, Gompa itself. Um, now things have a little bit changed because uh, the Gompa has been enlarged. Uh, for those of uh, you who have an older experience with that, um, uh, you might recall that the, the, um, the windows or the doors were one uh, step more uh, inside um, than they are now. No? So things have changed about a little bit. In any case, this external fence has remained and it represents the um, this balustrade represent um, which is painted in a, um, quite a brilliant vermilion represents the outer vajra fence or fire fence that encircles a mandala in general in Tibetan uh, tradition. Okay, so from this we have this information that the gompa is actually understood as a mandala. In, this, in the sense in which the mandala is a, a kind of a world in itself, it is a symbolic representation of a dimension of existence in all its aspect. It is a kind of microcosm, okay, that contains the whole in a symbolic and uh, you know, reduced way it contains the whole of the universe, whatever we need to work with on our path to uh, freedom. So um, one uh, visitor or one um, student uh, interested in the teaching approaches the Gopa from the East Gate, enters into it. Ah, by the way, um, I should say that aside from these examples in the Western tradition that I, um, I took the freedom to present here, the, the bell uh, tower and the baptistry, um, this is a very common symbolism. For example, in China, it also exists um, uh, quite uh, strongly. Probably there it is even more uh, relevant and uh, apparent than in other traditions. For example, um, uh, even the, the dress code of um, uh, traditional Chinese functionaries um, prescribed uh, square shoes and round, round hats, no? where the octagon was the person in the middle, no? uh, because the person is the one uh, represented obviously symbolically. Uh, in, in India, we have a lot of uh, mandalas or yantras, in, uh, more commonly known in India uh, than mandalas, that are um, square, octagonal, and uh, circular, in, and they combine these three uh, ideas, where the reference is to that. Square is the earth, octagonal is the middle world, and uh, round is the uh, heaven or sky or uh, however you want to see that. In any case here, when you enter, and I'm, you enter from number one here, and uh, if you ha have the uh, nice experience to, um, to um, find the gumpa empty, no? uh, you will see that on the floor, unfortunately, I did not find a picture for that. On the floor, right in the center of the gumpa itself, of the pavement of the, uh, you know, the floor of the gumpa, there is a, um, a lotus made of different kinds of wood, a symbolic lotus. No? This represents the 
uh, Earth as the, um, or even below the Earth, the uh, potentiality that gives rise to the whole of the universe, the perceptible uh, universe. And it is right uh, under this lotus here, we will come back to that later, that is looking from down from, uh, from the top, from the ceiling, and uh, represents the more, um, you know, uh, the aspect of possibility. Now, these are two quite complex um, concepts. In India, they are called um, Purusha, the possibilities, meaning the, um, the place where things are conceived in principle. And then Prakriti, downstairs, the possibility that gives, that provides the matter, let's say, for the formation of things uh, is down below. And these two, uh, maybe you can also call them uh, paternal and maternal aspects, if you like, of the world, uh, they collaborate to produce everything in between. So this, uh, this element is represented here by the lotus in the, uh, in the floor that is uh, made by wood uh, of different colors in the, uh, in the floor. Then when you enter, you will uh, look around you and you'll find that uh, here maybe, yeah, here. Um, more or less that's uh, your view when you enter the, the gumpa. You will find that uh, you have eight um, sides around you when you look horizontally. Each side has a, uh, is a, the main part is made out of windows of uh, doors sometimes, on top of which on the inside, there are um, eight big panels that uh, are very uh, intensely and uh, painted uh, with figures that kind of crowd these panels very much. Um, these figures are um, a kind of um, selection of masters starting from the uh, so-called 12 primordial Buddhas, which you can see here in the uh, panel just in front of us. This is the panel on the Western door, and it is the one that you uh, behold when you enter from the Eastern uh, door. And, um, and around it, all in the eight uh, you know, panels, there are selections of masters um, in which the center figure kind of gives the, um, the spiritual um, uh, note or register uh, that um, kind of, you know, um, rules over the selection of the other masters present in the panel. Uh, for example, here in this panel, we have um, um, Kuntu Zambo or Samantha Badra in the middle, uh, surrounded by another uh, 11 uh, figures, masters. Then there are others on their extreme sides, um, which represents the Buddhas of all the eras. Um, difficult to say what kind of, and, and the magnitude of these eras. But in any case, all the Buddhas that are mentioned in the Dzogchen tradition that Rinpoche wanted here to be the most um, the the the, um, the the tradition represented uh, centrally, let's say, uh, in this in this uh, group. Around him, here you can see to the in the panel to the uh, right side. Uh, I think the center figure is a burn. Um, enlightened being, Tapihritsa, if I remember well. And then here there is Guru Padmasambhava and so on and so forth, uh, surrounded by 
um, uh, other masters that in, in, in a way or another are related to the tradition of this central figure. That is, this is um, very important. And there would be so many things to say about these masters, not only their selection, but how they are positioned in the Gopa. They are in the highest position, uh, vertical position, let's say, belonging to the vertical part of the, of the wall, of the, you know, the, the, uh, the side. And um, uh, they kind of uh, bring with them all the tradition that they represent and all the, um, the rings in the chain that um, connects us, the viewers or the visitors or the receivers of the teachings with that very principle that is the origin of the teaching itself. So these masters are kind of representing our very possibility to become enlightened. The possibility of the uh, um, Lampawa, as they call in, in Tibetan, the, the person on the, on the path to, um, you know, um, enter the footsteps of these masters and climbing slowly, slowly backwards, arrive to the condition or this, the, the, uh, the state, the liberation that um, um, these masters represent. As you might know, Tibetan tradition, Tibetan Buddhist tradition in general is called, uh, has been called by uh, the first Western um, uh, visitors uh, to the, those regions as Lamaism, a word that is not very much appreciated by Tibetans themselves, because it seems that there is a worship of the person uh, the, of the Lama, but rather it is a, uh, the worship of the principle represented by the Lama, not the person, but what the Lama can give you access to. And that is obviously crucial, no? And um, um, so when you enter the Gompa, uh, you are surrounded by the representatives of all possible schools of Tibetan Buddhism without any uh, prejudice, uh, just picking out those who were uh, kind of representative of a certain uh, view or who had certain particular important experiences that were then uh, crucial for other masters to attain uh, realization. Another thing that we notice is that when we look horizontally, we see these eight um, sides, these eight, uh, uh, yeah, um, sides of the of the gopa, and these represent the eight um, um, the word doesn't come. Um, the eight, sorry, the four cardinal direction, of course, and the four intermediate direction. No? So uh, east, west, north, south, and then the intermediate between them. These um, are quite um, strongly represented and um, how you say, um, taken into the forefront of attention by a number of symbolic features that are present in the, uh, in the Gompa itself. You can see them here on the top in the lotus. Um, and you can see them all around. Maybe I can show you some image. Well, here some uh, close-ups of the masters. Uh, no, this is uh, Guru Padma Sambhava with his two uh, concerts and uh, Milarepa is obviously there. Uh, below, for those who can read Tibetan, uh, underneath each image there is a, 
um, a uh, caption that uh, says who the master is. Obviously, all of these images are uh, painted according to the, uh, the traditional iconometry and iconography of these masters. Some of them have a rather standard iconography, so they are easily recognizable. And for those who can read them, like for example, let's see uh, Guru Padma Sambhava, there are a lot, uh, many, many, many symbolic items that he is adorned with, particularly in, um, in any of his actually um, manifestations. No? So you can really read his biography out of the, this uh, iconographical, iconographical details that he uh, has. No? Um, this is also Milarepa is uh, easily identifiable by the position of the hand beside the ear and also by the uh, pale color, sometimes uh, is quite green and so on and so forth. Um, um, Machila Drun, also the, the um, yogini who was a transmitter of the Ch practice, which is also very important and used by many masters, including, including uh, Nima uh, Dzogchen master. Masters, she is typically recognizable by the uh, um, skull drum, hand, uh, handheld uh, skull drum, which she um, raises in her right hand. Um, there are also um, um, masters with a more standardized uh, iconography, such as, for example, the um, the, this is uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama. Um, he is kind of represented having the uh, lotus and the conch shell and, and also the book and the sword, which are uh, kind of iconographic items of Avalokiteshvara and Manjushri. No? So you can read a lot of stuff out of simply uh, beholding these um, these masters uh, paintings. But what I wanted to say is um, that um, there are a, um, another a group of elements, maybe um, here I should um, discuss this one and then come back to an image more, uh, more detail about, but time is running quite fast. So, um, so let me uh, forget about that topic. Maybe we can <laughs> talk about that a little uh, on another occasion. I was going to, um, to, to talk about the um, relationship between and the, the symbolic interplay between the octagon no, understood as a symbol for the horizontal world and the beings, uh, so-called beings of the eight classes, which you might have uh, heard about. Just to give you an idea, in these uh, eight directions, um, in the panels outside from the uh, doors of the Gumpa, in each direction, there are uh, ornamenting um, ornamental syllables and mantras that are um, related to yet another um, instrument that um, builders and iconographers of Tibetan art have to um, obviously in their uh, doctrinal perspective to uh, help beings on the path. So you, you remember we have talked about two elements. Uh, the first one being a kind of uh, geometrical shaping or um, structuring of certain elements that is kind of uh, instinctively recognizable by anyone. Second is a more sophisticated uh, 
symbolic language that needs to be familiarized with in order to be fully understood. No? Like this one's the iconographies of the masters, you need to, um, to familiarize with all the items they have, the colors, the position, the, uh, and so on and so forth, in order to fully appreciate, to fully get the message that they are meant to, uh, to transmit, aside obviously from the uh, blessing itself that derives from their very presence. Another thing yet is what we might call apotropaic aspects of Tibetan art. In this, these are uh, elements that do not have necessarily a, um, they are not meant to, um, to interconnect with the viewers of the object of art, but they are understood to have the intrinsic power to perform certain things. For example, to keep um, unwanted harmful beings outside, no? This would be also the function of the Vajra, uh, the flames outside, no? In the, um, in the balustrade around the, uh, the, the temple. Um, but other elements um, here um, have this function intrinsically. Um, they are sort of uh, also performing two kinds of uh, different uh, purposes in the way they are used. One is this apotropaic function, the sense, the idea that these sacred representations, mostly uh, syllables, sounds that is, uh, that kind of um, have the intrinsic mantric power that they, uh, of the sound they represent, that have the um, ability to um, uh, regulate the surroundings, to harmonize, to keep um, the beings, for example, of the uh, eight so-called eight classes of um, 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 the eight, generally they are just called the, the eight classes, the beings of the eight classes, in which uh, we have a um, they are eight, obviously. Each of them uh, presides or uh, rules over one of the eight directions of space. Oh, uh, one thing that also might be interesting is that in general Tibetans um, consider space to be in 10 direction. No? They, we have the eight directions, cardinal and intermediate, and then we have the um, nadir, meaning the, the um, down, no? and then the uh, zenith, meaning the um, upper direction. No? So these are the 10 directions and the observer is always found in the center of them, of these uh, 10 directions. So each of the eight horizontal directions is ruled upon by a being. No? Maybe some of you have heard the names of Varunapati um, uh, for water uh, representing the Nagas or uh, Vayu, uh, the um, uh, wind um, representing Mamos, uh, Kubera, um, Ishana, Bhuta, and so forth. These are their Sanskrit names. Uh, or Indra, who is the king of the gods in India, and he presides over the eastern direction. And for example, is represented by the syllable A. Okay, so by putting these syllables in the various direction that are presided by these various beings, you 
communicate to them and kind of harmonize your relationship with them um, because they can be either very helpful or very harmful according to the relationship you establish with them. No? In other words, they can be either fierce demons or kind uh, like angel-like figures, right? So um, another um, Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, I wanted to have at least one image. In any case, um, I seem not to have it. In any case, um, on these uh, panels, uh, particularly on the outside of the Gompa, which are meant to be uh, observed and uh, seen by those who approach from the outside are also um, several inscriptions of mantras, okay? No one can read, read them because they are written in a uh, very sophisticated um, script, generally understood to be a Nepali script called uh, Lenza or Ranjana script. Um, which um, have the function to um, not to address neither the, um, let's say the uh, aspect of the individual that has an artistic shock by looking at a work of art, no? Because he understands uh, what is beyond that. Now, what is what the uh, communicated principle is beyond the form? No, um, some people have this opportunity. Some people have also the culture to do so. No, um, it is also not an artistic language of the kind of the iconography that we have uh, seen before, but it is something that me is simply meant to implant a cause of liberation, maybe in some future life, uh, without any, any conscious uh, active contribution of the individual. Simply because he has become, uh, he has come in contact with these mantras, with the sight, no? Um, this installs or, um, yes, installs a cause for liberation in the future in that uh, being, no? It is meant for also animals that are like cats and dogs that might happen to circle around the, uh, the, the gompa. They look at the mantra above and they have this uh, cause implanted in them that will that that seed implanted in them that may, will be maybe in future uh, ripening and bringing them towards full enlightenment. So um, anything you see with any strategy possible in the Gompa is meant to forward beings on the path towards enlightenment. But there is a thing, uh, like here, this is another um, a, a thing that I did not mention in these kind of things. You see uh, the design uh, produced, uh, you know, by hand by Rinpoche uh, in order to instruct how the, the things must be done on the uh, original manuscript, which is uh, written on a common school, you know, uh, uh, workbook. Uh, with squares no, for um, mathematics. <laughs> and so here you see a particular that is taken from the Sipaho um, astrological um, uh, chart that has the, um, according to Tibetan tradition, the 
capacity and function to um, harmonize elements with the colors and with the forms that are depicted. Um, oh yes, here you see an example of these mantras I was talking about before. Here, it, this is being uh, repainted. It's not fully finished, you can see. But um, you see clearly the mantra, and this is meant to be observed and uh, um, kind of, you know, interiorized by beings that are not particularly interested in the other aspects of the teaching, the more formal ones. And um, um, in fact, the whole Gumpa, which is now um, called uh, the Dukanting and Zichemo, I think, uh, the, 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 actually, it's not really called the Gompa, but a Dukang, which means an assembly hall, and Tingenzin Chamu, which means of great contemplation. Originally, and I, I'm not sure why the name was, was changed as a, at a certain point, it was called uh, Tongdrol, which means liberation upon, be, upon seeing. No? Um, a thing that provides liberation upon being seen. And the reference was to the very activity of these, uh, of elements such as this, no? And in fact, many other elements might be really attractive for beings to that, to the teaching. No, I see this, I like it, I, it's very interesting. I want to go beyond appearance, I want to understand. Um, other apotropaic elements in the astrological world. Here you can see uh, they have left the old pre-restoration uh, chart here. These are the 12 animals of the calendar with the uh, eight trigrams and the numbers of the magic square, so-called, inside. Other decorative elements, but I don't want to go too far. And one of the... Um, uh, most astonishing, in my opinion, aspects of the uh, the uh, gumpa is the ceiling, no? Which, as I said before, is a kind of tent-like. It looks like a tent, but it is um, sh um, built in a way in which they are. There are eight sectors. You might identify them. Uh, each sector is painted with three colors. Uh, the colors should be mm, silvery white, green, and red, in order to represent the three as, um, um, active elements, Ram Yam Kam, the three ap active elements producing all phenomena. And on this uh, is written a, a very important, uh, it's called a song, um, a very important mantra in the Dzogchen tradition. It has uh, various versions and so forth, but um, uh, one of these versions is written here. And it is written in so-called square Pakpa style. Maybe I have an example here. Um, the letters, this is called Papa because it was invented by the uh, nephew of Sakya Pandita, uh, uh, Papa, uh, Papa Gyaltsen, I think it was called. Um, and it kind of um, arranges the Tibetan letters of the Uchen script into squares, more or less, no? or rectangles. So um, the the letters can fit into a, a square pattern in a square, you know, um, place. Uh, they were they are very much used for um, official documents and uh, seals, for example, for masters that have seals. They use very much this uh, style because they fit very well in square things. In any case, um, you see what defines the letter are actually, so the letter is made by this black uh, lines here, mostly, you know, very 
uh, um, orthogonal um, lines. And these white ones are uh, basically the intervals or the empty parts, let's say, no? in, the, in the script. So these white elements, in other words, can be understood as the ones forming the letter, um, but they are the place where color is absent, no? where you don't write. So it, this is very interesting because, in my opinion, because um, the lines that you can see here, maybe I can make it a bit bigger, no? Maybe I have another one. Yeah, maybe you can see it here. Um, oops, this is still in Italian. I'm sorry for that. Uh, this is the manuscript by Rinpoche from the manuscript by Rinpoche. It was slightly different, no? Um, it, this represents the lower part here, okay? And uh, you can see these uh, dark blue lines. Uh, the manuscript says that all in all three sectors, the, these dividing lines should be in blue color, okay? And the idea is that these lines are the sky be beyond, if you like, or a representation of the ultimate dimension of Dharmakaya. No? Um, the, uh, the background of emptiness, if you like, upon which with the um, material of the elements, these syllables that are the principle of manifestation and of the, um, the uh, permeation of the teachings into the manifested world uh, are produced. No? So in a way, this, um, uh, the syllables of this uh, mantra, which is considered to be a synthesis and a representation of um, the uh, whole of the Dzogchen teachings, um, they kind of uh, shine in the sky like stars in the firmament uh, on the background of the empty sky. And this empty sky uh, is, should be represented here on the top of the spire, which becomes always more and more round shaped. Then the round shape, you see this is the design for the lantern on top, no? still octagonal here, but then going into a ball, no? spheric, a tile if you like, and then ending into um, um, seizing forms, no, into a beyond that is completely beyond any form, no, where um, uh, kind of enlightenment is required. Yeah, this should be a blue tile. It has not been made like that because of technical um, problems, I think, probably, uh, representing this emptiness of the very Dharmakaya, the Dharmadhatu, the ultimate reality of phenomena, or if you want to say it in other words, that which goes beyond words. Okay, I think I should st stop here. I'm sorry for being a bit, maybe uh, not following a clear path, a clear line here and there. But um, as I said, it's not so easy to talk with my uh, table and my computer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fabian. Um, I, I think, uh, it's a wonderful time to, to stop um, and uh, hopefully just open up the floor to questions. But I, I 
do suspect that you know we in the audience get a, a glimpse of the vastness of the significance of this incredible seed of the assembly hall this this gompa um and just to to also say that um we would definitely like to invite you back to extrapolate on particular aspects of it but before we rope you into something else let's um open up to the floor we do have some questions already uh in the in the chat um so our options really are for people to kind of raise their hands and uh, then um we will ask you to unmute yourselves um but uh, we can also read out um Darina, um, would you like to read your questions or would you like me to read out? Yes, I could ask my question. Thank you very much. So I was uh, wondering if we have eight classes. I, I have never actually heard the description of each of these classes. Many of them are more uh, famous. We uh, communicate with them more often, but some of them are um, too exotic. Uh, could you explain each of the eight classes? And then, when I was looking at the um, at the um, uh, these um, uh, symbols um, on top of the door around the long sun, long south symbol, there are only six symbols around the long south symbol that communicate with the eight classes. Why only six? Just uh, yeah, well, this is a, um, a different set of syllables. These are the syllables for the six uh, beings in the six locus. See, see. Thank you. Thank you. I see. Gods, asuras, men, pretas, um, animals, or animals, pretas, and hell beings. No, these are for them. The eight syllables are. Um, uh, I don't think they are presented all together, but they are these ones, you know, like on the um, lotus on top. Okay, uh, well, and saying something precisely on the eight classes, I think we can have a separate lecture for each of them <laughs> and we would not finish the, the it's a very, very complex uh, topic in a way, but um, not, for example, one of the, 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 the Lord of them all is Indra. No? And Indra is a God of Indian origin, uh, said to be the king of the gods, no? like um, more or less uh, Zeus or uh, Jove in the, in the Greek tradition, Greek and Latin tradition. And, uh, you know, you can have so much um, mythology and all that uh, to them. And also ritually, they are quite important in the, in the Tibetan tradition because uh, whenever you do any ritual, mostly these elaborated uh, tantric rituals that they are so famous for, uh, you always want to uh, dedicate at least a piece of the ritual to coming to terms with these uh, powers no? because you don't want to be disturbed you want them to also uh, get um, profit from the teachings and um, also you don't want you know uh, problems for other beings to be made you know so in fact these are groups of beings, sometimes quite large, no, uh, classes, um, which are headed by one, um, one, you know, individual being that is said to be their Lord. And he presides over one of the directions of space. Okay. Sorry, but I, I I cannot th um, go too much into detail with that because, um, uh, of course, it's a really big topic. No, also their iconography. For example, some of them are the nagas. No, they are very interesting and are very uh, have a real big set of symbolism within Tibetan Buddhism. No, 
Um, so it's it's very difficult to you know break that down for in a few minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, I think Fabian, we completely empathise. No, um, uh, even in a, a milder aspect of it, that's a completely a, a few lectures within itself. I suspect. No. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's right. You you could you know a lot of things have been written also on the eight classes. Great. Um, so maybe what we can do is uh, point to people to a uh, kind of bibliography about that. Um, if it is possible, we've got a few more questions. Um, would you be open to taking a, a few more? I'm going to go with yes. Can you hear me, Fabian? Yes, I can. Oh, grazie mille. Um, okay, so this is from uh, Natalia. Uh, Natalia, do you want to read out or would you like me to do so? You can unmute yourself. You can ask, please. Okay, um, sure. Uh, Dear Fabian, does the symbolic work only within the Tibetan Buddhist culture or are there some aspects which have universal meaning? Thank you very much. Well, um, I think there are both of these elements in, in the Gompa. In the I think um, there are certain things that are quite universal, of course, um, uh, you know, you can never say of total uh, universality in the sense that you get, you are sure that everyone can understand it. But everyone who has a um, a certain understanding of their own tradition, let's say, can um, also understand certain informations that are um, transmitted through the symbolism that is present, for example, in the group. Whilst others, for example, the mantras, you know, the, the song of the Vajra on the, um, on the ceiling and um, the, the, the iconography of the master and so forth, they are more um, availing themselves of a specific language, expressive language. Um, art needs to be understood, this kind of art, you know, let's say, um, the art that is not um, intended to be or understood to be the expression of um, some individual emotion or the emotions of an individual, like so often art is understood these days, no? but rather to be a language with a very precise grammar and a very precise, you know, um, vocabulary that uh, is not instinctive, but it is uh, technical. It needs to be uh, acquired. It, one needs to familiarize with it. You know? For example, in the uh, Gompa, the colors are very important. They represent the elements, they, um, so for example, the primary colors, no, like blue and so forth, they represent uh, the elements. They can be mixed, so they represent um, collaborations and, um, you know, um, uh, coming together of various elements from various sources and so on and so forth. So um, this, of course, is not, um, cannot be defined as, as being universal because um, it, it is not understood without a training. Okay, so um, let's say that maybe we could envision that some of the principles that are represented by means of this um, language are um, universal. Okay, so for example, uh, well, 
um, the importance of the master, let's say, of someone who uh, instructs beings into uh, following the uh, the path. No, so um, many other things. For example, the um, I, I didn't have a, a occasion to speak about the um, plant symbolism inside of the Gumba. There, there are a lot of plants, flowers, um, gr grape, um, simil grape, um, you know, plants and so forth. And uh, also they represent um, um, symbolically the development of the world within the principles that kind of contain everything. The Gompa is, and in this sense, also this might be a universal language, is a microcosmic representation of the whole universe. No, it contains the principles that rule the whole universe. Fantastic, thank you, uh, Fabian. We have another question here. Well, quite a few actually. Okay. Um, so the uh, this one pertains to the six syllables on the front of the gompa. Mm -hmm. um, so it asks the six syllables on the front of the of the gompa are the six lokas. Uh, yes. Or the six spaces. Mm -hmm. So um, well, the six lokas, um, meaning the the six um uh, samsaric uh, possible births let's say or the forms that you can take being born in samsara uh, the gods the asuras the um animal uh, sorry the humans first the animals the um pretas and the hell beings these are six uh, samsaric possibilities let's say or groups of possibilities uh, which um, kind of summarize all the possible births uh, that beings go through again and again and again and again. No? Wonderful. They are also present in uh, many mantras. Not many, but a few very important mantras. Thank you. I think uh, I think that that answers and, and touches on it as well. No, um, there's a well, quite a, a few questions that that I also have, um, which is, you know, in in terms of in comparison to other temple Buddhist temples and gompas, um, both in the east and, and the west. It, am I correct? Is it correct that the representation of the three different kayas that they, you know, they're the they're represented within the the roof component, and then with other Buddhist temples that you would have different, uh, uh, how to say, um, like floors, like the ground floor, uh, the middle floor, and the top floor. Oh yeah. Yeah, this is a different um, kind of uh, symbol symbolism. No, uh, it can refer to the uh, to the um, so-called uh, kamsum, maybe uh, the uh, desire form and formless realms. It can refer to the um, three bodies uh, and so on and so forth. Here, there is no intention to produce. You see. Um, Maybe these, um, uh, and you, you, you might notice that um, in those gompas which have three floors, mostly they have three floors, the ground floor is the biggest and it becomes often very small on the top. No? This is also an important um, expressive um, element in which the more gross is the one which has more in quantity. No? The lower level has more in quantity and as you go on, it becomes smaller. <laughs> and um, um, this is a 
symbolism, let's say, that stresses stages on the path also, no? You, you climb steps, you get up some um, stairs, some, you know, um, you climb from floor to floor. So you have this, it contains, among many other things, this idea of going step by step, no? Here, the idea is different. Here is, the idea is that all, everything is contained. This represents the whole universe at once because the whole universe is the same in a way, no? There are no steps. You, you get into the, you know, whatever you want to call it uh, instantly. This obviously is a big topic also in, in um, uh, you know, the history of Buddhism, but according to the Dzogchen teaching, there is no progression, but there is a instant recognition or understanding or realization of the uh, ultimate reality. There should be, at least. That is what the master tries to put the uh, students into, uh, the experience. Fabian, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm just noting that we have, we're a little bit over time, but if yes. we can beseech you, um, would you be would you be open to having a, a, a few more, a little more? Yes, of course. I, you mean now or? Um, no, no, no. Uh, another occasion. Now I'm starting to starve, actually. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, then maybe maybe we will we will have a little compassion then. Um, no, 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 no. We can go on with it. If there are questions, uh, we can uh, um, go on. But if you mean in other occasions, yes, of course. With this, okay. uh, with this uh, virus situation, we have, um, we, we, as probably most of you, we don't travel very much. So we have a lot of time uh, staying mostly home. <laughs> oh, well, so we um, can kind of spend time meeting in these ways. No, it's it's very it's very precious, and and we are we are most appreciative. So we are demanding both of you. Um, so if uh, there's a, another another question really is um, to do with you know are, are there any other Dzogchen gompas or temples in existence uh, now or historically? Oh, that is a very interesting question. Um, I've been desperate to ask you. Yeah, <laughs> this is a very interesting question um, in the sense that. Of course, there are many temples and monasteries and so forth in which the Dzogchen is the main uh, or the, the, the core practice, let's say. There is even a monastery that is called Dzogchen Monastery. No? In, uh, uh, originally in Kham, uh, Eastern Tibet, and now um, uh, transplanted to Southern India, uh, south of Mysore in South India. Um, but there is a big difference because um, in general, the appearance of these uh, monasteries that tend to be monasteries of the old school, the ancient school, the Nima school, um, they do not um, kind of uh, have a Dzogchen appearance, let's say, in the sense that Traditionally, uh, Dzogchen was, has always been understood as a very high elevated teaching, not necessarily productive for all. No, and on the contrary, it is, uh, it was always understood to be something that needs to be kept uh, quite secret. And in fact, it is something to be kept quite secret, but uh, also in, in, in the sense that it does not, um, uh, it cannot be taught to openly, to, you know, indiscriminately to many people. Um, 
in general, when you go to these monasteries and you ask, ah, there's a chain, maybe late in, in recent times it has changed a bit, but if you asked, uh, do you have, you know, Dzogchen teaching, Dzogchen practitioner and so forth, people at first are quite embarrassed uh, because it's something that it's not, uh, is not meant to be talked about openly. No? This obviously has a lot of cultural and, uh, and um, you know, how to say, uh, historical reasons, okay? But in the West, the way in which particularly Chögyal Namkhenorbu decided that it is uh, productive and uh, um, achieving correct results um, to present the Dzogchen teaching um, is different because these historical and culture, cultural elements are not present. So um, in a way you could hope that um, for that reason, some minds might be fresher, no? Or if you like more, uh, how to say, um, un spoiled by uh, previous cultural elements in that uh, respect. You, I don't know if I'm clear about uh, no, that. No, it's clear. It's clear. Um, people in the West do not have any idea about Tibetan Buddhism, basically speaking. No? So they are prepared to accept the thing in, it, in itself, the teaching in itself, no? without uh, categorizing or establishing that it belongs to this or that school and so I am from another school and you know contextualizing it because they don't have any context you know of course another thing is then to uh, be able to correctly understand it and to correctly practice it that remains to be seen in my opinion <laughs> if it's the case um, uh, but, you know, obviously the idea of planting seeds that will bring fruit in the future is always in the background of uh, the Tibetan master's mind and intention. Mm. Yes. I would like to thank you, Fabian. I'm okay. Being, I'm being besieged. Um, to to let you eat. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I think um, everyone, uh, I think, will join me in uh, just extending our gratitude um, for your lecture this evening. Um, and, you know, we look forward to definitely hearing more. Um, and it was just, you know, a wonderful thing to to hear more about especially from yourself thank you very much i really appreciate your invitation and also the selection of the topic uh, is very interesting of course there are a lot of things to be said but um, um, it, it would be uh, it will be um, my pleasure also to go on with that topic, with other topics as well. But also, it would be really nice for me if um, uh, maybe you have an occasion to go to the Meriga Gompa one day and then look at it, uh, you know, closely and in this idea of uh, which I tried to, in a way, uh, communicate, you know, of reading mm. the 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 master's teaching in as formalized through the gumpa oh I, I think i think everybody is going to is going to definitely from from this talk it, we it's opening our eyes to to many different levels even though i'm i'm sure that we are just having a, a glimpse um but it is nice for you to to bring the the grammar of seeing um, a little more into, I think, our, our awareness with it. Okay.